Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. The thought, my thought tonight, will be called Yaakov's Fear and Anxiety. So, fear and anxiety are two emotions that we would much rather avoid. There seems to be little benefit that either of these emotions affords us. Fear is defined as an unpleasant emotion caused by belief that someone or something is dangerous or likely to cause pain or a threat. Anxiety is defined as the feeling of worry, nervousness or uneasiness, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. Why would anyone entertain either of these two emotions? They're negatives. If we look into the Torah in the book of Genesis, in the portion of Ayishla, we find in chapter 32a that the Torah describes Yaakov as Vayira Yaakov Ma'od Vayetzer Lo. That Yaakov was very frightened and distressed. Yaakov was experiencing a moment of fear and anxiety. But why? As the previous verse states that his brother Esau was coming to meet him and with him was an army of 400 men. Now the last time that the two brothers saw each other, Esau was intent on killing Yaakov for stealing his blessing. As the Torah recorded in the portion of Toldos 2741, after Yaakov had taken Esau's blessing, Esau said to himself, and it quotes, the day of mourning for my father will be here soon. I will then be able to kill my brother Yaakov. Now Yaakov was also concerned that Esau's aggressive advance was a sign that not only his mother, which he knew had passed away recently, but evidently his father had also died. It was now some 34 years since he had seen his brother, and he could not be certain as to what Esau's intent was. However, the fact that he had 400 men accompanying him, hmm, seemed ominous at best. So why would Yaakov have put himself and his family into such a questionable and possibly dangerous situation in the first place? We read in the previous portion, in the portion of Ayetze, in the beginning of chapter 31, verse 3, that God says to Yaakov, go back to your birthplace in the land of your fathers, and I will be with you. Now, even though God himself had instructed Yaakov to return to his father's house, he still called his two wives out to the field to ask Rachel and Leah to ask their opinion about leaving their father's house. Now, this is a valuable lesson in forming and maintaining a good marriage. Communication. Even though God Almighty himself had told Yaakov to leave Lovin's house and return home, still, he sought the advice of his wives. He made them feel like they were part of the decision process. Following his example, we also need to create open lines of communication and respect in all of our relationships. It makes the other party feel important, uh, part of the team. So Yaakov leaves Lovin's house with his family. But now he is forced to confront not only his older brother, but also his own fears and insecurities. But why wouldn't he feel anything but secure? After all, it was God Almighty himself who told him to return to his father's house. What are we missing here? Can we identify his concerns and then use them to deal with the issues in our own lives. So what issues are we looking at? First and foremost, sibling rivalry, which began in the womb, actually. As the Torah tells us that Rivka was having a difficult pregnancy, and so she went to see the prophet of God to gain some understanding as to her unusual discomfort. She was told by God that there were two nations in her womb and that they were contending one against the other. One child would be righteous, and the other would be evil. Duplicity, with Yaakov outsmarting his older brother Esau by taking both the birthright and the blessing from him. And then there's marital prospects. There were those who had said that Esau, the eldest brother, would marry Leah, who was also the eldest of Lovin's daughters. Then Yaakov, the younger brother, would marry Rachel, who was also the youngest. Meanwhile, <laughs> Yaakov winds up marrying both. There were also issues with parental preferences, where the Torah tells us that Rivka loved Yaakov and Yitzchak loved Esau. But the main thing, I think, also was choosing different paths in life. Esau was referred to as an Ish Tzayed, a man in the field. He was a hunter. 
someone that was involved in the secular world. Yaakov is referred to as an Ishtam Yosheva Holland, a perfect individual living in the tents, which alludes to the tents of Torah. He lived a religious lifestyle. Two completely different approaches on how to live one's life. These were issues that existed between them and had never been resolved. In addition, they had not spoken or seen each other for the last 34 years. Yaakov had no way of knowing what if any of these issues Esau still entertained. So, so let us examine what factors called Yaakov's fear and anxiety. After all, he was a tzaddik, a righteous individual following God's instruction. He, Yaakov understood that even though he was a good son, Esau still had two merits that he, Yaakov, did not possess. One, that Esau was fulfilling the mitzvah of Kibbutz, honoring his father. And second, that he was living in the land of Israel. Now, the Barashish Rabbah states that Yaakov was afraid of Esau because Esau had spent the last 34 years of his life in the land of Israel. And he was coming against Yaakov with that merit. We know that this encounter took place before the giving of the Torah. And there was therefore no obligation to live in the land. So the question has to be, why was Yaakov so afraid of this mitzvah? Answer, because God had told Abram Avinu, Lech lecha, go travel to the place I will show you. So this command given by God was also given to the descendants of Abram. And Esau, being his grandson, also had this mitzvah based on a grub. Still, it's strange that this one mitzvah made Yaakov feel so insecure. After all, he told Esau, I lived with love and I still kept all Tariag mitzvah, 613 commandments of the Torah. So from here we learn that this one mitzvah of living in the land of Israel, even done by a non-Jew and an evil person, like Asa was able to stand against the many mitzvot done by a righteous individual like Yaakov. How much more so when even a simple Jew lives in the land of Israel, even today? How precious this is in the eyes of God Almighty. As it states in Yaakov Shmoni and Echa, God says, if only all my children lived in the land of Israel, even though they may defile her. The commentaries give us many reasons for Yaakov's state of mind. The Ibn Ezra says that God's promise to Yaakov was not enough to dissolve his fears for the sake of his children and his household. After all, God's promise may only have extended to him alone. It might not have applied to his family and possessions based on Rabbeinu Bachai. The Chizkuni says that Yaakov did not know if Esau's coming was to welcome him home or to do him harm. He states that a doubt in one's mind is the worst possible situation in which to find oneself in. Yaakov didn't know what to do. When you prepare for everything, hmm, in reality, you prepare for nothing. The Malbim says that Yaakov's fear was the reason for his anxiety. He realized that in spite of God's promise that he would guard him, he was still afraid. And this thought caused him great anxiety. Yaakov was afraid that God might not perform a miracle for him since he didn't have perfect faith. Therefore, he attempted to devise some plan that would save himself and his family through natural means. The Chassam Sofer says that Yaakov was told by Lavan when they met at Har Gilad that God had appeared to him in a vision in the night. God had warned Lavan not to pursue his evil intention against Yaakov and his family. However, it appeared to Yaakov that Esau was free to follow his evil intentions. And this fact caused Yaakov fear and anxiety. The Hasidic works tell us that a man in his weakness, very important, often runs away from situations that God has orchestrated for his benefit. The reason why God wanted Esau to meet with Yaakov was for Esau to come to terms with the events of the past and to recognize the rights of Yaakov. However, Yaakov, due to his realistic approach, was afraid of their meeting. The Holy Baal Shem Tov explains on the verse in the end of Psalm 23, which states, Ach tov dufuni kol May only happiness and goodness pursue me all the days of my life. 
Governor Mala King David prayed and asked God that if in my ignorance I run away from goodness and mercy, then you should nevertheless arrange that they pursue me and overtake me. As we see, that is exactly what happened. The meeting of the two brothers turned out to be a benefit to both of them. The Barbanel has a unique interpretation. Had Yaakov not been afraid, it would have been a sign that he trusted his brother Esau. But now that he was afraid and distressed, and yet he still went to meet with Esau, it was clear, a sign from heaven, that he had complete faith in God Almighty. Now Rashi on this verse states that he was afraid, lest he be killed, and he was distressed, perhaps he would kill others. Now the Hebrew word for others is acherim. This is a term that is found in the Mishnah. It is used to refer to Reb Meir, who was a descendant of Nikon Kaiser, who was a Roman general who converted to Judaism, a descendant of Asa, based in the part of Yosef. Now, anxiety is a greater emotion than fear. So the Raubach says that Yaakov was more concerned about killing another person than he was afraid about being killed himself. Now, if Yaakov had killed Asa, then his descendants, the children of Israel, would have had to be exi exiled amongst another nation. The Talmud, the Gemara, and Gittin, 17 states, that the children of Israel ask God, conceal us in the shadow of your presence. And if not that, then in the presence of Asaph. Why? Because an exile amongst any other nation will be too severe. Now, Yaakov analyzed what he thought Asaph might still have issues with. He felt that Asaph might still feel anger, that Yaakov had stolen his firstborn rights. So Yaakov acknowledged Esau's position as the eldest child. He did so by presenting him with many gifts. In addition, he bowed down before him seven times when they first met to show his respect. Rashi tells that Yaakov prepared himself in three ways for his upcoming meeting with his older brother. First, he sent him gifts, then he prayed, and then he prepared for war. Prayer is in the middle because everything Everything comes through prayer, gifts and prayer, and then prayer and battle. Everything, even those things that seem to be natural, need prayer, which is why we connect tefillah, our standing prayer, the Amida, with the Hebrew word geula, redemption. And even though redemption appears to be a natural order, it will only happen through our tefillot, our prayers. Now, in the Medrash Rabbah, it states that Rabbi Huda Nasi would read this portion of Vayishlach before he would have an audience with the Caesar or any public official. There are those who have the custom to read this portion every week after they recite Havdalah, this separation between Shabbat and the weekday, as a form of protection and good fortune for the upcoming week. Rashi says this portion is not so much a protection for good fortune as it is a directive on how a Jew should act in a Gentile world. Just like Yaakov, first be nice, send gifts, then turn to God with prayer, and then, only then, as a last resort, war. Based on this advice, on a natural level, we as a nation have been able to survive where other nations have been destroyed. We only followed Yaakov's advice while we had autonomy as a nation. Once we were under foreign rule or exile, the sages took away the option of war. You know, when someone says, give me liberty or give me death, well, they usually end up dead. So whenever we were faced with oppression, we would use the tactic of bribery, meaning gifts, and in addition, we would pray to our God for our salvation. It was not until after the Six-Day War in 1967 that Jews, Jews all over the world, were able to hold their heads high again and say to the world that no, we are not sheep to the slaughter. Asaph's question, Asaph questions Yaakov when they first meet. His questions, he asks him, 33-4, Me, Ela, who are these? Alluding to Yaakov's wives and children. Yaakov replies, How you love them? They are the children whom God has been kind enough to grant me. Now, if you move the letters of Ela around, it spells the word Leah. According to the commentaries, 
Asaph's question was, he was asking Yaakov how he could have married both Leah and Rachel, two sisters at the same time. The Torah prohibits a man to marry two sisters. Yaakov answers him that they are hayaladim, they are children. He was alluding to the fact that they had converted to Judaism, which gave them the status of newborn children, not related. Yaakov knew that Esav had little use for anyone who would spend their days totally involved in Torah study. Esav was a businessman. He worked for a living. He earned his keep. He may well have seen religious people as lazy, unproductive, with their hands stretched out constantly for donations. So Yaakov tells Asa, interesting, that he has one ox, one donkey, one sheep, one manservant, and one female servant. The wording is strange. After all, Yaakov was wealthy. He had herds of animals and many servants to attend to all of his needs. Why would he phrase his words in the singular? Asa could see easily that Yaakov had much more than just one. What Yaakov was telling his older brother was that he had worked very hard to acquire all the possessions that Asa saw. Every ox, every donkey, every sheep, every servant were all important to Yaakov since he had worked hard and diligently to acquire all that he possessed. He appreciated and respected a dollar. He wasn't a lazy person waiting for someone else to pay the bills. He, too, was a businessman. He wanted his brother to recognize and appreciate that he was not the same person that Asaph knew in his father's house. He was now an independent family man who worked hard to support and maintain his family. He wanted Asaph to know that there was more that connected them than divided them. He tried to put himself in Ace of Shoes, and he addressed what he thought were the issues that his older brother might still entertain. He made Ace of feel important. He did so by presenting him with all types of gifts, and then by prostrating himself seven times as he came towards him. Yaakov did all of this in full view of all of Ace of's friends. His acts of humility and kindness were able to change Ace of's demeanor as an adversary and remind him that in the end, they were still brothers. Instead of battling with each other, they embraced and they kissed each other. Were the emotions that they, that they displayed real? Would they last? That was not important now. They had avoided a conflict. You know, better an insincere peace than a sincere war. As we look around us at the world today, it seems that hatred and controversy are the order of the day. There is, a fear, there is fear and anxiety everywhere we turn. There seems to be no desire to come together to compromise. You know, we need to push the hold button and reboot. I'm afraid that if we do not, the end result will be that we will self-destruct. I'm, I'm afraid that if we do not, the end results, oh, pardon me, we, hatred it is easy to take. It takes a little effort. Love and peace, uh, not so easy. There is a reason why we begin our morning prayers with the words, I recover my missus, I say, shall be a half to the Reach Kumoko. And I accept upon myself the positive commandment to love my neighbor as myself. This command is not directed at loving, lovable people. <laughs> no, no. God is telling us that if we cannot coexist with those who have different ideas, different lifestyles, different desires, then we cannot exist at all. And that is exactly what happened at the beginning of the creation of the world. The same scenario occurred again during the Second Temple era. The end results of both was total destruction and annihilation. Fear and anxiety are natural feelings that we all experience at some time in our lives. We need to look to our patriarch Yaakov, and learn to deal with our challenges in life through wisdom and perseverance and pray to God for his assistance. And with that, let us open our hearts and love. Let us look at our neighbors and see only good. Let us open up our hands to help another. Let us close our mouths to evil chatter rather than close our hand to strike another. 
Let us open our mouths to compliment rather than criticize. And with all of this, may we usher in the coming of Mashiach Sukeno quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. Again, God should bless you and yours with only good. Stay healthy, stay safe, stay happy. Again, thank you for listening.